Hi everyone, welcome to Inclusion Revolution, a strategy session on designing culturally relevant inclusive education solutions for the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. My name is Melissa Diamond and I'm the founder and executive director of A Global Voice for Autism. To get started, let's talk about what we mean by an inclusive education. Often, when people think of educational inclusion, they envision a classroom where children of diverse backgrounds and abilities are present. While this is certainly an important first step, bringing diverse students together in a physical space is not enough. An inclusive education is one that supports the development and success of all learners, and that acknowledges that such an education is not about helping a student become normal, but about helping every student become the best they can be. Take a moment to think about what makes you different from your peers in the groups you spend time with. Write these things down. Maybe you practice a different religion, have different political views, speak a different language, or have a different skin color. If you can't think of anything, I encourage you to make an effort to spend more time with people who are different from you. Now, make a note next to each of these aspects that make you different. Are you proud or ashamed of each of these attributes? Are there any of them that you wish to change? Review the list of things that make you different and imagine if, because of these differences, you are not allowed to attend school, are unwelcome at events in your community, and are told by people in your family that they're ashamed of you because of these things that make you different. Imagine too, that on the rare occasions that you are allowed to attend community events, go to school, or spend time with others, you're forced to do so in environments that were not set up for people like you. To illustrate this, imagine that you're an English speaker who arrives at a networking event to find out that everyone else only speaks Chinese. Or imagine that you're a very tall person who arrives on your first day of work to find out that all the doors in the building are only half a meter tall. In both of these situations, there's nothing inherently wrong with you, but because of your environment, you may be made to feel inadequate. In many places, this is the default experience for children with developmental disabilities and learning differences. For a society that idolizes greatness, we sure place a lot of emphasis on conformity when it comes to how people with disabilities are treated around the world. If you think about Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, none of these people got to where they are today by being quote unquote normal. Granted, they were probably helped by their gender, nationality, and the color of their skin, as the first three people I thought of when I was looking for this example were all white men. But that's a discussion for another time. The point is, we don't become great by being normal. And yet, too often, normality becomes the benchmark for whether children with de developmental disabilities and learning differences can access education and participate in their communities. When it comes to most types of difference in the world, people can find communities that meet in the middle and value the diversity that results from bringing together different types of people. But around the world, this meeting in the middle is next to non-existent for children with developmental disabilities and learning differences. From a young age, most children are taught that there is an acceptable way to exist in the world and that their energy should be focused on conforming to normality. When I was a child, I used to hum whenever I was focused intently on something. I learned to read before kindergarten, was ahead by, of most academic milestones, and could sit and focus on activities for extended periods of time, just as long as I could hum. And now, if you're thinking of a young child humming songs all day, that is not what this was. I would hum in a monotone and block out every other sound in the world around me. In fact, when I was doing this, my academic skills were so advanced that my parents enrolled me in a Spanish language school, fearing that I would be bored at a school taught in English. And while I'm sure a lot of preparation went into going to a school taught entirely in a different language, I remember only my parents' constant reminders not to hum in school, not to do anything that would make me stand out as different. Well, 
I managed not to hum in school, but I also didn't talk. Humming was my self-taught strategy for self-regulation, and I needed it to focus and to block out all the background noise, bright lights, and overwhelming smells that came with the school building experience. Rather than engaging with my peers or focusing fully on what was going on in the classroom environment, I spent the time at school reminding myself, though probably not quite succeeding, not to do anything that would make me stand out as different. While I was a high performing student, I never spoke at school. In fifth grade, my teacher sent me to the school psychologist to figure out why I didn't talk. Well, she didn't find out much because I didn't talk to her either. I wasn't being defiant and I wasn't a bad kid, but the environment I was in did not allow me to do the things I needed to do to be most successful. And rather than making adjustments that would allow me to perform at my best in a way that met the needs of all involved, I was encouraged to be normal which affected my performance. I still remember sitting next to my mother in my sixth grade parent-teacher conference when my teacher informed her that she should just give up because I was never going to be successful if I couldn't speak in public and couldn't make eye contact. I'm happy to say today that this teacher was wrong. I hold two master's degrees that I earned through full ride fellowships, have traveled to 76 countries, run an international inclusive education organization, and have given two speeches at the United Nations. But not all children who are different are this lucky. In many parts of the world, children who behave like I did when I was a child never get the chance to go to school. Neither do many children whose support, who support and learning needs are far greater. This is why I started A Global Voice for Autism. A Global Voice for Autism equips conflict-affected communities to support the development and success of children with autism and learning differences in their classrooms, homes, and communities. Development and success are the instrumental words here. When we train teachers and caregivers to support and include children with autism and learning differences, our focus is not on training them to teach the child to simply conform to society, but on training them to teach children skills that can be used in, in their communities and on teaching inclusive classroom practices that help all children become the best they can be. You may notice that I use the phrases children with autism and autistic interchangeably. Some people with autism, particularly in the US context, prefer to be referred to as autistic as they view autism as a core part of their identity. Others prefer the term person with autism and this is especially true in certain linguistic contexts where autistic doesn't always translate well. In this presentation, I'll use both terms interchangeably, but when you meet autistic individuals in your community, the best thing to do is to ask the individual and their caregivers if the individual can't answer the question independently, which term they prefer. But now back to a global voice for autism, at least COVID, pre COVID-19. A Global Voice for Autism works in conflict-affected communities, both refugee communities, with refugees as well as their hosts, and in communities that are living through protracted conflicts. We've served 13 communities, including those in Jordan, Turkey, the Palestinian territories, and in refugee communities in the United States. As I'm sure you can imagine, for the families we serve in these communities, their needs often extend far beyond autism support. In the communities we serve, we see high rates of poverty, food insecurity, and domestic violence, as well as high disability stigma. In the communities where we work, many families even hide their autistic children and children with developmental disabilities at home to prevent judgment and blame from their communities. Some children and some communities believe that autism is a curse, and in others, Families worry that their other children won't find anyone to marry if their autistic child's diagnosis is known. Since we launched our first program in 2014, we've seen positive changes in awareness and understanding in the communities we serve. But in most of the world, there's still a long way to go in understanding, much less accepting, autism and learning differences. To account for the complex realities in the communities we serve, 
A Global Voice for Autism uses trauma-informed practices and takes a holistic approach to inclusive education. We realize that teachers and caregivers are better able to support children when they are well supported. And so we integrate support programs throughout the model. Every parent and teacher who takes part in our programs participates in a peer support and self-development group where they not only have the opportunity to share their experiences supporting children with autism and learning differences, but also learn new practices for self-care, identify their strengths, and reflect on how they can integrate these learnings and practices into their lives. Since siblings often play a key caregiving role when supporting children with disabilities, we also offer a similar program for siblings where they can connect with others with similar experiences, often for the first time, while developing themselves. Additionally, a Global Voice for Autism recognizes that caregivers know their children best and are uniquely invested in their children's success, while teachers have much to offer when it comes to educational strategies. For this reason, we train caregivers and teachers together in both theoretical and practical training sessions. Program participants are placed in small groups with a mix of teachers and caregivers for practical sessions, and they learn from one another as they hone their skills for supporting children. When, through these relationships and through advocacy by teachers, parents, and a Global Voice for Autism, some of the children we support join classrooms, well-developed relationships between the children we support as teachers and caregivers ensure their ongoing success and support. Some say that it takes a village to raise a child, and we've worked to build a global village and community to support children, caregivers, and teachers alike. Every caregiver and teacher who completes our programs gets access to a Global Voice for Autism's virtual community, where they can take part in virtual follow-up support sessions through video exchanges. We also offer this program to families in high conflict areas who cannot access in-person services. Finally, we know that teaching caregivers, teachers, and children is not enough. We also have to teach communities to challenge misconceptions and prejudices and to understand the value of cultivating an inclusive community. To do this, we host community events that combine fun and inclusive activities for children and adults with education about what autism is and the value of accepting those who are different. For example, as you can see here, we hosted an autism inclusive carnival in Jordan where children with and without disabilities played games together. And then at every station, children learned a fun fact. For example, at the station you see here, the fun fact was, some people with autism don't speak, but that doesn't mean they don't have anything to say. Signing and pointing are just a few of the ways people who don't speak might communicate. Tell us about a time you communicated something without using words. The child might then say that yesterday they wanted ice cream and when their mother wouldn't let them go to the store to buy it, they started crying to communicate that they were sad the child would get a stamp on their scorecard and then gets to play the game and earn prizes. But between having over 90% of children make substantive improvements in communication during the program, over 95% of parents and teachers decreasing their parenting and teaching stress levels by two points on a five point scale, and having 93% of teachers who go on to advocate to their schools for improved inclusion practices. A Global Voice for Autism has seen widespread success and many, many promising indicators in our data-backed results. However, as you can imagine, we've had to adapt significantly due to COVID-19. At the beginning of the pandemic, we conducted a survey of families in our programs that had a 96% response rate. What we found was striking. 41% of our families were experiencing food insecurity as a result of the pandemic. And 21% either had or were at risk of having their electricity cut off due to inability to pay their electricity bill. Additionally, while 19% of respondents reported at least one incidence of domestic violence in the six months preceding the pandemic, 39% reported at least one incident of domestic violence since the start of quarantine measures in their countries. When it came to children, 43% showed new self-injurious behaviors during quarantine. 
even with all of these other financial and safety challenges, 30% of families listed educational and enrichment activities for their children as the top need during the pandemic. In response, a Global Voice for Autism launched our Include 2020 initiative, which has been recognized by Hundred, Open IDEO, the Clinton Global Initiative, and One Young World for its innovation in supporting children with developmental disabilities and their families during COVID-19. Because we know that for children to be well positioned to learn and for their caregivers to be well positioned to support them, families need to have their basic needs met. So we launched an emergency fund that families can apply to for in-kind support needs like food and counseling during the pandemic. With the closure of in-person centers and schools and substantial changes in routines, many children started to display new behaviors as well as to regress in areas where they had previously developed skills. To address this, we've launched a series of online training modules in Arabic for our community. They, these modules support families in everything from developing new activities during the pandemic to helping children develop communication skills. For families who need additional support, we offer one-on-one -on -one consulting sessions with trained professionals who offer this guidance and support. Finally, we believe that COVID-19 is not just a temporary challenge, but an unprecedented opportunity to innovate education and improve the inclusion of all learners. To lead the way on this, we developed our Included 2020 mobile application. You can see a sample video from it here. The application employs refugee teachers trained in inclusive education to make three to five minute caregiver training videos to help caregivers and eventually teachers teach children foundational academic and ind independent living skills, as well as offer enrichment activities that develop skills while engaging the whole family. The app is entirely developed in Arabic and all activities are designed to be completed in low resource settings with basic items found around the hub. Because many of the families we support don't have consistent access to internet, we've designed the application so that users can download content into the app, watch it on their own time, and then return to a location with internet to download more content. After we beta test with our community, the application will be available for free to Arabic speaking caregivers of children with autism and developmental disabilities worldwide. While we always have areas in which we can improve and constantly strive to do so, we've developed some insights for developing culturally appropriate inclusive education solutions during the pandemic and beyond, and are happy to share those with you today. First, when developing solutions, think about community realities. Just because a program is evidence-based or works with children with developmental disabilities and learning differences in a certain context, doesn't mean that it's universally applicable. Context needs to be considered when designing effective interventions. What skills are culturally valued? What resources does the community have? Do people have access to technology? Make sure your solution doesn't just work, but works with the communities you aim to serve. Second, inclusive education is a two-way street. It's not just about teaching a child to adapt to society, but about teaching societies to think differently about difference. At A Global Voice for Autism, we've done this through our inclusive community events, like the carnival mentioned previously. And also, when we offer social skills groups for children with and without developmental disabilities, we don't focus on teaching children with disabilities to play like children without disabilities, but instead on teaching all children to play together and to take turns engaging in activities that are fun for all. At our inclusive education, or inclusive play field day in Jordan, Kids took turns choosing games, including rolling around in the grass, playing Red Rover, and spinning in circles. They followed each other's leads, sometimes following a game initiated by an autistic child, and other times following a game initiated by a child without autism. Third, acknowledge cultural norms. Don't try to apply the norms of one culture or society to another. For example, in the US, Many argue that Autism Awareness Day should focus instead on autism acceptance. But in many parts of the world, people haven't yet achieved the awareness stage. Additionally, in some parts of the world, eye contact is culturally valued and taught to children who don't make eye contact naturally. 
And while this can be problematic for a variety of reasons, and I do recommend looking into that as you're designing programming, there's other parts of the world where eye contact is considered rude in certain contexts. It's important to take the time to understand the culture, not just through research or observation, but by integrating local context experts into every aspect of inclusive education, training, and programming. Fourth, in the pandemic and beyond, sometimes the skills that will benefit children are not those that show up in a traditional curriculum. This has been highlighted during the pandemic. For many children, staying on top of math and literacy are not the most important things they can do during COVID-19. Skills for independence, social skills, and self-regulation may be far more important for some children with and without learning disabilities during this time. Think about alternative ways to measure academic success and progress, especially for learners during the pandemic, and recognize the importance and value of this non-traditional learning. Even beyond the pandemic, some of these non-traditional measures of student success can be integrated into classrooms not only to highlight the strengths of different students, but also to develop a more holistic picture of the skills students need to prepare them for life in the world today. Traditional measures of academic success are no longer enough to prepare students for success in our rapidly changing world. So let's think differently about what is measured and valued and create measures that meet students' realities. In conclusion, we live in a world that values greatness and achievement in various forms. So why spend our time teaching children with disabilities to be normal to everyone's detriment? Let's instead teach every child to be the best they can be. Thank you for joining me today. And my contact information is on the screen below. Thank you.